Okay, so it's after 930 y'all. What I'm going to do is for those of y'all who have not seen it yet. I'm going to start trying to share my screen. Let's see, share screen. And what am I looking for? Inbox, I think. Yes, share. And where is my all right, let me move this to the side. Can everybody see my email? Yes. All right, so everybody should have received one of these emails from Padlet. Did everybody get one of these? Uh, yes. I, yeah, I think I got one. Let me know if you don't, and I'll send it again. But you should have gotten an email like this. You go into the email, and it has this button, this pink button. So I'm going to show you what happens when you click on it. And let me screen share with the new screen of what happens. Let's see. Nope, it's this one. Share. Okay, let me Where'd it go? There it is. This is driving me mad, I swear. Anyway, can you see the ocean picture? Yes. Yes. Y'all? Yes. You can see it, Nikki? Mm -hmm, I see it. Okay, super. So this is what Padlet looks like when you click on it. And it's kind of like a private Facebook. If that makes sense, it's got the feed here with the oldest things being at the bottom and the newest things being at the top. Um, I'm going to start posting little questions here. And I just put this one because I thought it was in um, a non-threatening question. What went well for you this week? Um, We've got, and you can add comment just like on Facebook down here. You know, click on that space and type. I have the to-do list, and the to-do list is essentially that check, check sheet that we had for communication. Do you remember that check sheet for the module? Yeah. Okay, so next to these, this is the session number. So session number one is number one. Session two is number two. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. All right. Now down here, number eight, nine, and 10, those are not sessions. So number eight is, did you read the, the community chapter in your textbook? Yes or no? Number nine is, did you do the lesson plan and turn it in? Stop, Gigi. Number 10 is the competency statement. All right, so it has that for communication, the creative chapters. So this is session number one. We have session three. We have. So this is like the paper you were sending on the Google Docs, correct? Yeah, the checklist. Yes. Okay. Yep. Just wanted to just I just put it all in one spot for you. Okay. So number five here is did you read the textbook chapter? The reason I put that in there is because I think a lot of questions for the test are gonna come from the textbook and we need to be able to say we've read it and if you have any questions, get those talked through. Okay. Um, and then self and social. You will notice for self and social, there's only how many sessions? Three. You're welcome. <laughs> then we have two textbook chapters because it's two chapters. We have two lesson plans again because it's two chapters. And I'm not putting the turn in date on that and I'll show you why in a second. And then we have the competency statement. If you go to the top of this thing, you will see a selection of dates. May 1st through May 13th. This challenge 
is a challenge for you to knock out everything that you haven't done yet. Make sure you watch any presentation you haven't seen yet. Make sure you read the textbook chapters you haven't done yet. Check and make sure you've turned in your things, all of them by May 13th. Do they have to be perfect? No. Does anybody have a Yes and no. I have one because I was looking at the yellow book like I said I was. Sure. And I noticed for the, because you we were doing the self and the social today. So then I have the emotion that I haven't done unless I did it and I misplaced it. Let me turn. I think you're looking at the lesson plan sheet, right? Yes. The nine learning experiences? Yes. Because I'm going to just a the three lessons so on the emotional and skills and regulation uh -huh. B27 is the one minute no that's not it um it's two six the rc two six self-concept that goes with the self chapter did i put that down if i didn't i'm a bad person i'm sorry Oh, I did. No, no, the I put. Yeah, this. Um, say again. I'm sorry. Can you repeat yourself? No, I did it wrong. This number seven should be a number eight right here. RC two eight. Okay, I'll but I'm missing the R RC two seven. That's because we haven't done it yet. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that's good. Yeah, that's, right. that's the one you need to so be. Everybody, so we're, we should be just missing the three, correct? The six, seven, and eight? I believe so. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because for some reason I was like, oh my God, I don't. Okay, I thought I, I, thought I was missing something that we already went over. Okay. So yeah, that's a typo. I apologize. Okay. This is RC28 here on number seven. Okay. These numbers. The RCs and all don't really work for the way my brain thinks. Um, I'm doing my best with it. Um, let's see. I'm you this leaderboard sheet and tell you kind of what's going on with that. So these numbers at the top are the same numbers that on that um, list we looked through. So this is session number one, session two, session three. And then the stuff towards the end is usually lesson plans and reading textbook chapters. Okay. The sessions that I know for sure y'all have participated in are live sessions. So if you notice some people like Chihuahua has a lot of these dark, these are sessions that Chihuahua has attended in person. So if you're watching recordings, there's no way I know that you're watching a recording, right? Um, the only one I can say for sure that nobody's watched is I have one YouTube recording out with no watches at all. And I'm like, hmm. Um, okay. So if you have, so I want you to go through and check. Check the ones on YouTube and see have I watched all these, either live or on in the recording. Once you've checked those and you know for sure you've watched them, send me a text or send me an email saying, I have watched these, mark me down as finishing them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So that way I will know, I'll mark you down as having done it. This is on the honor system. I know you all are honest people. So watch them, let me know, and I'll mark you down. However, if somebody tells me, that they have watched a YouTube recording on the one with zero watches, I'm gonna get suspicious. <laughs> Why? Well, the only one that I haven't watched of your YouTube was the one, the last one that I was able to do live with you. I actually checked that this morning, Leanne. I was like, hmm, I'm gonna call BS on that. And I went and I looked and I was like, no, she is on the live. It's okay. 
Yeah, okay. Because so I was like, I think that's the only one that I didn't didn't watch, which is the uh, environment and language. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was like, because I watch them. <laughs> and then there's also the ones on Google Docs that Sean Yell did. If you're having difficulty finding them on Google Docs, again, send me a text or send me an email and say, I can't find session number five for communication. Send me the link and I will do that for you. So by the time May 13th rolls around in order to win your personal challenge, all of these need to be in a dark color. But this also, I'm not going to give anybody a certificate of completion of the course until you complete the course either. So you got to kind of do it either way. But this is also I fun when I can see that I'm making progress and know where I stand. Yeah. And if anybody, so I don't want people to say what their avatar is, but if you look at your avatar and you say that avatar is not cool, feel free to send me a different picture or say, I don't want that avatar anymore. Swap me out and I'll definitely do that for you. Okay. So I'm going to leave Padlet now. Does anybody have any follow-up questions on that before I leave it? No. I'm going to post the leaderboard every day, at least every work day, um, showing how people are doing based on what I've seen so far. I'd be delighted. I'm going to start posting here um, practice questions to kind of help you prep for the test. So oh, yeah. the more often that you can pop in and do one of those practice questions or respond if I ask a question and somebody um, gives a response, if you can comment on it, it makes it more interactive and I think more fun that way too. But it's, it's your call, your life. But Practice questions, I think, are always good to get your juices flowing before a test. All right. I agree. So today we're going to do it a little bit differently. I did a different kind of presentation. It's going to be very succinct, the information I pulled directly from the book, the kinds of things that it wants you to know about self and social development. We're not going to get real nitpicky into stuff that you're not going to get tested on. So we're looking at understanding the emotional and social development of children ages birth through three years of age. And we're going to start by looking at some developmental milestones. I noticed your textbook gives you the developmental milestone chart in the self section and in the social section. Uh, some of the general ones that children have uh, very early on are expressing their feelings without speech. So for an infant, what is that usually? Crying. Yep, it's like, I am not enjoying this, let me tell you. <laughs> um, understanding that they're separate from somebody else. So that's a big one. Exploring uh, using our senses. We have that, that every single chapter, what they learn by learning. So for self, that's exploring their own body. What can their body do? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And then exploring others. So is there squishing on your face, tugging your hair? Um, what are they learning about you? Uh, as they get older, they're learning um, what am I called. They're learning uh, names for their family, names for their friends. For um, even the youngest babies, they're starting to learn to recognize faces and then to start naming emotions and understanding what different facial expressions mean. I actually have seen a lot of um, suggestions coming out now for helping toddlers read expressions while people are wearing masks. Because that changes things, doesn't it? It does. It's like, what are these people thinking and feeling? I can't see 90% of their face. So have, having to talk through with children, 
you know, how you can still interpret somebody's emotions and what, how they're feeling based on what you can see. And that's a big deal. I actually was at, uh, went into a building the other day and I do not y'all, I look like a total nerd. I have my face mask on and then I have carpenter goggles on. So you can't see anything, but maybe it's my eyes. And I was smiling at the lady, you know, manning the thermometer at the front door. And I realized she can't tell that I'm smiling. So I said, I'm smiling at you. As I walked by. <laughs> she looked at me like I was insane, but that, that just shows you an infant teacher, right? I'm smiling at you right now. You can't tell. But just no, that's, that's me at the store. I'll be smiling. Like, you know, when you pass by somebody, you just smile. And then I notice my, I to myself, like, they can't even see me smile. So now I, I don't know. I'm a little smiling. nod. <laughs> So how is that changing how we're, how we're sharing our emotions with people when you can't see? I mean, one minute, let me get one of these suckers. I don't have my construction goggles with me, so y'all have to imagine on that. But it's like, okay, smiling. Not smiling. I mean, there's a little rise in the cheek, but other than that, there's not a whole lot going on. I used to watch um, America's Top Model with Tyra Banks. Thanks and smile with your eyes. <laughs> I don't know. They always looked at her she, like she was crazy when she said that. So I don't know if that actually had any value. All right. So let's look real quick at the CDC's developmental milestones. The reason we want to look at this is because we want to pick a milestone for our lesson plan. Yes. All right, so stop share, share screen, important milestones, yes, yes. Uh, all right, can everybody see the CDC milestones website? Yes. All right, super. So if you look, we can pick an age. I have six months selected on the side. So pick the age for your classroom that you want to work with. And it has social and emotional right there for you. And since they're both together, you're going to have to understand which ones are related to self self concept. So you need to have a lesson on self concept and you need to have a lesson on social skills. So looking at social and emotional, can somebody tell me out of these four, which one of those they think relates to self-concept? I like to look at self in there. What do y'all think? Yeah. Okay, are there any other ones for it? I think response to other people's emotions. But, I don't know. I think that might be more of a social because they're trying to read somebody else. Okay. Now, the oh, often the seems one. happy. No. That, would, um, that might be it. Sorry. I think... For the social, the faces? I, no? so I think the blue one here, I think the often seems happy is self. I think if it has anything to do with other people, it's mm -hmm. social. Okay. I think if you see the word others mm -hmm. or someone, anything that doesn't have the word self in it, I would be suspicious of. So let's pick another age group. I'm going to do 18 months and let's see what we can figure out from that one for social and emotional. Now there are some really good social and emotional songs that we do for kn knowing yourself, like touching different parts of your body while you're singing, uh, shoulders, knees and toes type things, or, um, if you're happy and you know it, 
looking at social and emotional for 18 months. Can somebody find me one that's self-concept? And I don't even know if there is one. I'm looking. It says my internet's unstable. Let me log out from something here and that might help. That explores alone. That's what I but with parents close by. That's themselves. Because it has to do just with them, right? Yeah. Because yeah. parents close by, if anything, that's just supervision. Yeah. And I mean, this one, you don't want to have a lesson for how to throw a temper tantrum, right? No. No. Let's let's skip that. Maybe afraid of strangers. No, we don't want to get that going. Um, ooh. What about the pretend? Yeah. Yes. Why yes. not, right? There's nobody nobody else there. The doll doesn't count as somebody mm -hmm. else. So that's cool. So I would definitely use that or the trying to set up a way to, ex an exploration activity, right? Mm -hmm. Let's pick one more and see what we can find. What do you think? One year or two years, y'all? Uh, two, two. Okay. All right, looking for one for self. One that you want to teach, not the show's defiant behavior. And it shows more and more independence. Okay. So trying to figure out what you could do to allow a child some independence or leadership in a classroom. Mm -hmm. What else? Anything else go for self on this one? And I don't know. I haven't read. Let's see. The first one could be questionable. That copies others. Yeah. I know you said others is normally. Yeah, but it doesn't mean but, there's somebody else there, right? Yeah, because you're just copying or mimicking so them, especially that, adults and other children. The copying, that kind of goes with what they were doing on the other one, the 18-month-olds of feeding the baby doll. Okay, that, yes. That's copying, right? Yeah. That's not something that you instinctively say, you know what, this doll needs to eat. They're, they're, um dramatic they're acting out what they've seen so yeah totally all right does anybody have a question about where to find a goal for their self-concept does anybody need help finding a goal for their self-concept lesson there's also the textbook so let me Stop sharing again. Let me go back to this. Share from current slide. All right, do you see the slide again? Yes. Okay. So you can also look in your textbook. Whoops. 342. Let me see if I can pull up 342. So they have on page 342, a whole list. So if you don't find one you like on that CDC, by all means, look on this 342 for the self-concept. And then we'll just have to, like you said, just to look how we just did on this one, to which one will be self. So on 342, it's all self all the time. Three because that's in the self chapter. When you're oh, going to do the yes. social one, that's a different chapter. Yes. And theirs is on page 376. I think I just read the top real quick that it says emotional skills, but then right. it is the green tab says self. <laughs> so here's the social, the social one. So the reason these kind of are getting squished and it's hard to separate them out is because in general, in education, we put them together. So we call it social emotional skills. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Yes. 
So they usually have them stuck together for a pretty good reason because they go hand in hand. You learn how to control yourself, how to self-regulate, usually because you see somebody else doing it and somebody's helping you build those skills socially. But it's still all about how you can help control yourself. And then self-concept, how do you feel about what you are is based a lot so on social, how are people treating you, right? Mm -hmm. So if people are treating you like you are the best thing since sliced bread, odds are you're gonna have a higher self-concept than somebody who everybody hates. So they're really tied together. I know at least once during my school experience, somebody said something mean to me and that affected me at least for the rest of the week. I don't, I'm sure I'm not the only person that's had a social experience like that at one point or another. Okay, any questions on finding a developmental goal for your, you can also go on Little Texans Big Futures do you want me to take a look at that real quick, or do you all feel confident in looking yourselves? Uh, you flip look right. with us. We can look real quick? Yeah. Yes. All right. Let me pull up Little Texans Big Futures. Yeah! What's happening? Are you all seeing the screen for Little Texans Big Futures? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Yes. I think it's going to be emotional development. Honestly, let's see. Ooh, look at that. They broke it down for us. Self-awareness. Self-regulation. I think it's honestly going to be self-awareness, y'all, because the regulation one is going to be that lesson number seven that we're not yes. doing right now. So let's click on self-awareness. Oh, good to know, though. That's there. Good to know it's there, though, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, so self-awareness, things that you can teach, crying. I wouldn't go there. <laughs> um, oh, this is zero to eight months, though, y'all. So if this is teenies, teeny tinies looking at themselves in a mirror. So that's pretty easy, right? To have a mirror play activity where you go and visit the mirror and talk, talk through what you're seeing. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, oh, and look, let's just for giggles, click on this. What can you do to support your child? Maybe that'll give us a clue about a lesson. Oh, here we go. Look at that. That could be a lesson, right? For zero to eight months. Yeah. Naming, naming expressions. Here's the other one. Give them opportunities to see themselves in mirrors. Here's another one. Help infants become aware of their body parts by naming them and massaging their hands, fingers, arms, legs, feet. I would think that'd be a lovely little play with one or two babies, right? It's like, I see your toes, hear your toes, I'm touching your toes. You might even have a, one of those, this little piggy songs or something that goes with it. Is there another age group you'd like me to look at, anybody? No, just for the fact that we know that it's how it's on there and broken down, it's actually really good. And definitely go into this, what can you do to support a child? Because it's giving you ideas. So self-awareness, 8 to 18 months. Imitating facial expressions. I'm sure that you can have a, um, some sort of song where I do this, you do this type thing. Uh, where's your nose? Where are your ears? And like head, shoulders, knees, toes type thing. Make so. faces, make faces together in the mirror. Uh, yeah. And let's look at 
Which one would be social, do you think? Trust and emotional security, relationship with others, what do you think? Relationship with others. I think you're right. All right, adult support for eight to 18 months, relationship with others. Um, so remember we did gross, I, I think it was Tawana that we did a gross motor with rolling balls. Is that correct? Yes, it was me. Okay, so it looks like you could do something similar because it says you can do. It's a, it's an adult facilitated circle time or small group activity that you play together. So something mm -hmm. like that would be appropriate. Um, what else do we have here? I'm not seeing, let's see, continue to name and label appropriate touch. Hmm. I don't, I've never seen a song for showing them how to do a gentle touch or how to give a pat or how to give a hug, but maybe there's one that exists. I don't know. Like a high five. That's a you have to be careful with that. I've noticed when toddlers give hugs, the bites happen. So <laughs> when they hug each other, because they're like, ooh, squishy. I would like that squishy in my mouth. <laughs> um, let's see. This, the showing empathy, is lovely. It might be that a lesson for this wouldn't necessarily be let's sit down and do a song or let's sit down and play a game. Maybe your lesson for the week is um, identifying emotions in others and helping. So it's just more of, I guess, like an action rather than like how we've been doing either one on one with the kid with the arts and crafts or anything, something like that. Is that what you're saying? So if like if in the I'm moment, like a how it's having an example of peach so that during lunchtime or snack time. Yep. Okay. So that would I think officially that's called a teachable moment. Teach, okay. So all the words you just said teach. Um, and I think you actually did say teach and moment in there, so <laughs> you, you nailed that. Um, but you could put this, so I know you do the lesson plans like for the week and you have different things for social and emotional and all that. Um, you could put identifying emotions and providing appropriate responses or something like that in more child-friendly terms or parent-friendly terms. So it could be helping, helping others when they're sad or helping others when they're angry. Um, and it could be that simple. It could be because you know in an infant and toddler classroom every day you're going to have at least one person that's angry or sad for one reason or another. And mm -hmm. you're going to be labeling that emotion anyway. You're going to be saying, oh, you look really sad tell because you're crying or I can tell because your face is all scrunched up what can we do to help you let's let's help you pick up your blocks that got knocked over let's help you um, clean your hands off let's help you make the sand castle but just being able to label and identify emotions and then help More simple, yet at the same time, more difficult to write down. Yeah. So it's up to you. If you want to do something that it's, that's um, a very structured, we're going to pass this toy back and forth or play, you know, play a game passing it, that's mm -hmm. fine. Or if you want to do something more moment, teachable moment kind of thing, you can do that too. Wouldn't that be a little difficult to break it down on our lesson plan that we do? 
Leanne, I think you can do it. If you okay. want to try that. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I think you can do it. If you want to try it, by all means, just have a whack at it. Mm -hmm. I'll look at it and um, help you structure it out if it looks like it needs a little help. Okay. But don't, don't be afraid to try it. Okay. Does anybody else have a question about where to find a goal for a lesson plan for self or social? Yeah. Hey. No, what was going on with this computer? Miss Nikki? No, I'm fine. I'll I'll probably look on this website. Okay. okay. Tawana, how are you feeling about it? Um, I'll probably have to look around on here. I guess if I get any if I get lost or anything, I guess I'll just have to contact you to I, I have my phone on me all the darn time. Let's see, I'm gonna actually type into go, Google self concept infant less, oh, it says activities. Uh -oh. Let's see what comes up, yeah? And we all know that, is everything you find on the internet good? No. No. <laughs> So just because somebody wrote something on here doesn't mean it's good, but it doesn't hurt to take a look at these. Who's the baby in the mirror? So that's one like straight off the, the, um, the website and the website, book, right? Yeah. So tips, unbreakable okay. mirror. Deve Ooh, they even put a developmental milestone. Look at them. They're fancy. All right, let's see. Sense of self activities from Hello Motherhood. See how we feel about that. Oh, what's the first thing again, y'all? Mirror play. Apparently that's the low hanging fruit for this one. Whoa, whoa, hey, all these things are popping up on the screen. Actions and consequences. Part of your toddler becoming self-aware is understanding that actions have consequences. Play a game that teaches your toddler that performing certain activities can have a positive consequence. Help your toddler pick up toys after a long day of play. Once you're finished, oh, heck no, we're not doing that. They don't get extra ice cream for that. We could just do vertical praises. <laughs> Heck no, backing away, hands in the air. What else? Oh, you're like, really come on, the motherhood. That is not good. <laughs> Ice cream before bedtime. Okay. Backing away, hands in the air. What else we got? <laughs> oh, looks like they put some developmental milestones. That makes me like them better. Let's see what else we got. <laughs> Are they giving any activities? No. I'm not seeing activities here. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Painting a picture of themselves. You could do that with older toddlers. I don't think you could do it with the babies with any degree of anything. It'd just be an art, uh, a sensory activity because they don't believe that, they don't understand anything beyond making a mark yet. Come on, y'all. What else we got? Mirrors again. Yeah, but that's more for the, the younger, like you said. Um, but the painting the picture, that one sounds fun. You could do that for older toddlers, but mm -hmm. younger than that, we learned in our art thing, they're not going to understand the abstract concept yet. Well, here we go. 10 ways to net. Nah, I want an activity. Let me try lesson plan here. I can't type today. Self-concept infant lesson plan. Virtual lab school. Okay, let's see. Teach us something virtual lab school.
A lot of writing, a lot of writing. Where are the lessons? Mm -hmm. They have a video. I don't know if you all have ever seen some of the videos in virtual lab school before, but they're pretty cool. Um, here's the mirrors again, y'all. And it has a video of how to do it. Okay, so a couple ideas, not too terribly many. I think we came up with more on our own, honestly. Let's see. Go back to the PowerPoint. Let me see if I can change the share. All right, so attachment. Attachment is important because if you have a strong attachment, then you're able to trust the world. If you don't have a strong attachment as a baby with a grown person, then you distrust the world and it's really hard for you to get out there and explore and learn. So, attachment can be formed by having caring reciprocal interactions. All those tips and tricks we talked about for communication, for how to have that respectful back and forth, paying attention to the child, having the child um, talk to you, you responding to what the child says, meeting the child's needs, so that goes for responsiveness. Is it true that you can spoil a young baby? I believe so. <gasps> <laughs> Science says no. Young baby being responsive to them. Now, there's being responsive and then there's being silly where you're carrying them all the time and you never let them move. So we'll see there's that though. But the is that spoiling? That's kind of being neglectful of their emotional uh, physical development. They need to be able to move too, right? Mm -hmm. So but letting, is it, can you spoil a baby by coming to their side and talking to them and stroking them and picking them up when they start crying? Yeah. That's not spoiling for a young baby. It's being responsive. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Right now, child development, it's considered developmentally appropriate that if a baby starts crying, a little one, you are supposed to go to their side and reassure them. Now you will have, maybe depending on your school, right? Every once in a while, a child that has to have special intervention because they have difficulty self-soothing for sleep. And in that case, usually you have a special um, plan from a sleep specialist or a pediatrician that tells you, we need this baby to cry for 20 minutes before you respond during nap time. But that's very rare. And I would definitely get that in writing. Because if you have somebody come to a, um, check out your classroom, do you want them to be in your classroom with a baby crying for 20 minutes without no. you looking at them? No. I mean, man, that'd get you kicked out, right? Yep. So in general, but baby's crying, they have a reason for it. So try to figure out what that reason is and help soothe them. So responsiveness helps build that trust attachment. So if they cry out because they need something and each time they cry out they expect somebody to come help them and somebody does come help them that builds trust right mm -hmm. if you cry out and people don't come to help you are you going to learn to expect people to take care of you no right 
if you don't expect people to take care of you as a young child, it doesn't go well for your social, emotional, and physical development. It's just not good. That falls under neglect, and you know, based on your own experience, that children that are neglected have a really hard time developing. They also need consistency. They need to develop a bond with somebody that will be there regularly. Can they have more than one bond? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So who, just off the top of your head, who are they usually bonded to already? The mom. Parents. Mom, maybe dad, maybe grandma. Yeah. Um, whoever is taking care of their needs regularly, right? Uh -huh. um, they can also and should form an attachment with you. Yeah. If you have more than one teacher in a classroom, you should have uh, somebody called a primary caregiver for each child. Has anybody ever heard this term before? Yeah. No, yes? I have. I have, not necessarily daycare wise, but. When, when, but... when have you heard it if not for daycare wise? I know I've heard it with, um... Like if they're dis like if the if they're disabled, mm -hmm. and they have a primary caregiver, which is a family member or a nice outside source of a family member. So that's the person that, in your situation, you're talking about. That's the person who the doctor would talk to and say, "This yes. is how this child needs to be, or not child, but this is how this human person. needs to be cared for." Mm -hmm. And if you want to find out how that human is doing, you might ask the human, but you also might ask the primary caregiver, right? Because mm -hmm. they know, because they spend a lot of time with that person. So for an infant classroom and a young toddler classroom, there should be, if there's more than two adults in the classroom, each child has a primary caregiver. So if you have, let's say, eight babies, Usually four of the babies have teacher one as the primary caregiver and four of the babies have teacher two as the primary caregiver. That's the person that as much as possible takes care of those babies' needs. That's the person that's writing down on the chart for um, the family what's going on with that baby. That's who the family reaches out to, to discuss that baby's needs. Um, it's to form that strong attachment bond. Some schools will go so far that they will transfer a primary caregiver up to the next age level classroom with the child. It's not a perfect system because you have different ages going at, you know, a time. But um, if they have those four older babies have teacher A in the infant room, then when it's time for them to move up to the toddler classroom, teacher A will move up with them. And then when it's time for them to go to the three-year-old classroom, teacher A will go back down to the infants to start up a new attachment with a, a fresh group. That's called looping. Um, it's not very common, but it is considered to be a really good practice just so they get that really strong bond formed to um, help out the children's development. So they have different kinds of attachment. We're not going to talk about the different kinds. The one that you need to know is secure attachment. That's the important one. That's the one we need to create. So I have a link here going to virtual lab school again. Let me change the share so you can see it. Can you see virtual lab school on your screen? Yes. Yes? Awesome. So if we look down on virtual lab school, it talks about how to be a responsive caregiver, 
So that has to do with responding and meeting the child's needs um, to interact with the child frequently. Um, and those are, as it calls it, protective factors, things that help build up that bond. So here are some things that need to happen for a caregiver. A positive attitude, and it talks about what that is. Um, smiling, laughing, um, acting as if you enjoy being around that child. Everybody wants somebody around them that wants to be there, right? Um, stimulation. So that has to do with putting out things in the environment that the child can help, help nurture them and develop them physically. Um, it also has to do with giving them that tummy time and interacting with them during tummy time and when they're playing. Um, support, that's pretty much the same as everything else. The response quality, that has to go with what you're saying to the baby. So anybody can tell a child, good job. Does it tell the child anything at all about what they've done? When you say, good job. Does that tell the kid anything worthwhile whatsoever? No. I mean, it tells them something good happened. They have no idea what. So instead, it would be better to use your words, like you tell the toddlers sometimes, right? Use your words and tell them what was good. Matching the child's needs. Um... This is the shared focus. Remember when we were talking about how you look where the child's looking? When the child points, you make comments on it. You, have, you try to develop a relationship together where you're enjoying being in each other's company. Have responsiveness. The cooperation where you give the child the ability to make some decisions and then you make some decisions. Um, you take a turn with something, they take a turn with something. Giving them space to grow like that. Physical contact. So some schools, once you get into pre-K and K, they don't want you touching the kids anymore. Why? Has anybody ever heard of a school saying, we don't want you touching the children? I haven't. You haven't? Well, that's good. Um, can anybody think of a scenario why a school might say, we don't want you putting your hands on the children? I guess just because other parents could see one, it looks inappropriate. Either we just do a hug or they could be like, oh, you're, you you grab them aggressively. Mm -hmm. Or when it's not, of course, that way at all. Mm -hmm. But people think the worst of people sometimes, or a lot of times. But humans need that touch, don't they? Yes. Especially, especially when I get at home. Especially our infants and toddlers. They need frequent, soothing touches right? They need to be held. They need to be rocked. They need to be padded. Good grief, they need to be padded just to get their burps done, if nothing else. Um, so physical contact. Mutuality, that's that shared focus again. Doing, being in the moment with each other and seeing what each other's seeing. And then basing what you're saying, your responses on what the child's signaling and cueing. All stuff that you already know. If you'd like, you can come. I gave you the link. If you'd like, you can come in at any time and look at some of these videos for being a responsive caregiver. I think they're absolutely lovely. I've noticed, however, when I try to share videos with you on here, it doesn't work. So I'm not even going to try that this time. Let's see, stop share. 
Ehol. Let's see. This jumping back and forth is hard on the screen. Okay. All right. Do you all see the temperament screen now? Temperament? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. Yeah, awesome. All right. Because we have been talking so long, I'm not going to go as far into this as I wanted to. But I put the two links here. I'm not going to take you to the first one right now. I am going to tell you the gist of it, though. It's from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It talks about temperament as being something that the child can't control. Those are their traits they're born with. Okay? It does describe, though, that some children that are born prematurely, premature babies, have temperaments that are specific to a premature baby. So maybe they have, um, they respond more strongly to stimulation than other babies. Um, maybe they cry more, um, they're more fidgety. And it talks about how you respond to those babies and how you can help to develop um, calmness and um, appropriate sensory responses in that particular um, situation. Okay, so if that's something, if you're in an infant classroom, I highly recommend you take a look at that short article. This other one is from zero to three. And it's a series called Tuning Into Temperament. Um, the reason we want to understand each child's unique temperament is so that you can interpret what they're doing and what's going on. If you have a child that each time it's time to go outside has a meltdown on the floor and you have to carry them limp and screaming outside, you want to try to figure out what's going on, right? You don't want to just keep that going without responding to it. So knowing maybe that child's temperament is that they don't take change well. Okay, good to know. How can we support them then so that doesn't happen as often? Does this make sense? Yes, I have okay. one of those in my class. <laughs> so temperament is, no, knowing about it also is good because you have a temperament too, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't just grow out of your temperament. It's good to know what sets you off so that you are not lashing out or acting out on a child that has a completely different temperament than you. So if you're somebody that responds really easily and well to change, Nikki, you might have a really hard time understanding why that kid just throws himself on the ground whenever it's time to transition. Yeah. Like, what is wrong with you? Come on, I'm ready for this. Why aren't you ready? There must be something wrong with you. <laughs> okay, no. If their temperament is that change doesn't happen easily, you need to understand that and be able to plan your transitions to support that child. Does that make sense? Yeah. Brilliant. It's not tuning into temperament. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a search here real quick. Oh, I hear a small person. Oh, my daughter. <laughs> All right, so here we go, tuning into temperament. Originally, I was going to go through with each one of these different temperaments and have you all tell me how you would support a child at each end of the continuum, but I've noticed that we've gone really long and I don't want to drag this out for you. So what we're going to do instead is I'm going to show you each of these. We're going to discuss a little bit about them, and then if you realize that you have a child that has one of these needs, you can go in and see how you can support them. Does everybody agree to that or would you like to take the longer route and talk through it?
I'm not hearing a response, so I'm just going to go with this. And you let me know if you need me to slow down. Okay. All right. So one thing that I found delightful in here is there is no right or wrong or good or bad temperament. A child is who the child is, right? They can't control that they're slow to warm up or that they're an adventure seeker. That's just part of who they are. Now, however, even though there's no right or wrong, there are some things that are more socially acceptable than others, right? It's more socially acceptable to be outgoing than it is to be shy, right? Mm -hmm. It's more, here, let's, let's actually look through and you tell me on each of these, which is more socially acceptable in our culture. Frustration. Is it more socially acceptable to get frustrated easily or to persevere in American culture? <laughs> to be frustrated. Which, which, just thinking about our culture, who would be more popular? Somebody that gets frustrated easily or somebody that can persevere? Oh, no, someone that perseveres. We prefer in the U.S. somebody that will persevere, right? We don't want somebody throwing a fit because they don't get something easily, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at the next one. Emotional intensity. Do we in the U.S. value, and see, this one can go both ways totally, I think. Do we value people that are more passionate or less pass passionate? I guess it depends on what. Right? What you believe. So, in general, we in the U.S., I think we appreciate people that are passionate, right? We want people to be like, yeah, I love this. This is awesome. This is my life calling. Right? I mean, you want people to sell it when they get up on screen in front of you, right? But in a classroom, do you want people that are more passionate? Hmm. I'm going to let y'all think about that. Which one's easier to take care of? Somebody that goes with the flow or somebody that's really passionate? Uh, I guess passionate. Really? That surprises me, Nikki. Um, it goes with the flow because it's just, cause you, come on. In general, because you have a group of kids, you want somebody that's just going to be like, zen and oh. calm right you don't want somebody that's flipping out and um reacting strongly to things in a classroom oh, okay. um however when we when they're grown-ups and they're in a job in general they want people that are really motivated and feel strongly about things i think i guess it depends activity level in the u.s do we prefer people that are always on the go or do we prefer people that are calm and laid back? On the go? You think on the go? Yeah. Okay. I think that's accurate for the United States. Sociability. For the U.S., do we prefer slow to warm up or do we prefer social butterfly? Slow to warm up. Slow to warm up? So we prefer I think social type. butterfly, but I guess it just varies the situation, varies. Yeah. That one's a vary as well. So, so that one goes two ways. If you have a group of kids and you're taking them on a field trip, you don't necessarily want those social butterflies going off and making friends with every other kid uh -huh. in the petting zoo, right? You want them to kind of stick together. However, if you have a visitor come to your classroom and is trying to talk to all these kids that are shy, what's going to happen? It's going to be a quiet classroom, right? Yeah. All right, and the last one is the one that Nikki was talking about, coping with change and transition. 
do we in the US value somebody that has a hard time with change or somebody that flows like water and can just go with it? Like water. Flows like water, <laughs> just go with it. So it, like I said, depends on their culture. Their home culture can also impact what is valued and what is um, reinforced. So if a parent prefers their child to be shy and, you know, cling to them more, you've seen it, right? On drop-off, some parents really want that child to cling to them and cry for them and want to be with them, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends what the parent is reinforcing as well. But if you click into any of these, does anybody have a preference for which one we look at? Mm, no. How about we do the coping with change? Because I heard Nikki say she had somebody that had difficulty with transition. Yeah, all the time after nap, he doesn't want to eat snack. And then when I say, okay, it's time to fall aside, he doesn't want to fall aside. When everybody else is ready to fall aside. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for this one in particular, coping with change. So we have the, the keep it the same children tend to react to even the smallest changes, uh, such as a new nipple on the bottle, new food on their plate. Um, they thrive on daily routines to feel safe and secure. They need a lot of time and support to get comfortable with something new. So it says for children who prefer this kind of life, the keep it the same, you can do these kinds of strategies. You can use comfort objects, um, like a stuffed animal. Some children have a pacifier that's their comfort object. Um, does anybody else have an example of a comfort object that their kids we might have? We have a child that has a jacket. Okay. We actually had one um, at another school I worked at that had um, a kitty, a stuffed kitty toy. And she loved that thing. She almost loved all the hair off of it, right? And the parents thought they were being smart and they bought another one, a backup, just in case that one died. And the kid found the backup. And then she insisted that she had both of them with her all the time. So that kind of bit them in the behind. Um, ease into new activities. Talk about things before you do them. Offer advance notice. So that's like when you give kids the five minute warning, the two minute warning. Do you know about five minute warnings and two minute warnings? I'm giving them a heads up, we're gonna switch activities. That's right. So that's really helpful for kids that are transitioning as well. And then it says for the kids that are go with the flow kids, you should also be supporting them by offering a variety of experiences and being sensitive to their signals. So even though they're a go with the flow, easy going, every once in a while they still might have that time of doubt or trouble and you need to be able to realize when they're queuing to that. So that's one example. Because we've gone over an hour, I'm not gonna keep you and go through the rest of these y'all, but I put the link in the PowerPoint, and I highly recommend that you visit this page and take a look at it. All right? Okay. Does anybody have any questions for the week about that? Um, what is that called again? Padlet? About Padlet or about the social emotional? No, not at the moment, but I know we're free to email you. <laughs> And text. Y'all, I've got my phone on me almost 24-7 now. I, I don't mess with it much on Sunday, but the rest of the week, it's pretty much glued to me. So anytime, all right? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming today. Okay. I hope you all have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.